In Psalm 56, we have one of his, his songs, one of his songs. And he says, This I know. God is for me. God is for me. Those are the four words. God is for me. There's a lot of people in the world that think God's against me. He's some big angry God that's going to squish you like a bug if you step out on him. They don't know that God is for you. His desire is to bless, to encourage, to enrich, to save, to protect. He is a good father. He tells the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36, 9, speaking in the first person of singular, he says, Behold, I am for you. Now that's God himself saying, I am for you. And I want every one of you here to know there's nobody in this church that he's not for. He's for you, not against you. This desire, he yearns to bless you, to protect you, to lift you up to higher places in him. And Paul writes in Romans 8, 31, since God is for us, who could be against us? It's good to remember that. Fear of God, there's nothing left in this universe to fear. Now when God says he's for you, what does that mean? What does that look like? There's a lot of ways to answer this, but Jesus, I think, gives us the clear answer. There's two ways. And he gives the answer in the 10th chapter of Gospel of John, verse 10. Jesus said, now remember, this is Christ who is the truth. There is no discovery of science, archaeology, or history that has ever disproved one word Christ said. Believe me, they've tried. They can't do it. You can trust what he says. And this is what he says. I have come that they might have life that they might have it more abundantly. There's two things there. Jesus came that you might have eternal life in heaven, forever with him. And number two, that you might have an abundant life down here. There's nothing left in between those two things. It covers it all. So let's look at those two four areas in which God is for you. The first one is, he's for you to be with him where he is. I would that that would be with me where I am. He says so. He wants us, he, he, he loves you, he wants you in heaven with you, with him forever. But we have this problem called sin. I was born with it. You were born with it. It was injected into the DNA of the bloodstream of humanity back in Adam and Eve. God tells us in his word, there is none righteous, no, not one. God tells us in his word, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes everybody in this room. God also tells us that the penalty of sin, the soul that sins, it shall die. Now, biblical death means separation. If you're, if you're only born once in a natural birth, or if you're going to die twice, you're going to die once in the mortal life, then the second death is separation from God and eternity into that other place. That's what the Bible teaches. We might not like this, but I tell people, when you can make the universe, you can make the rules. These are the rules. And God has laws for us, and they're all for our good. So he has made a way to take care of that problem. Yes, God is perfect, as God is way is perfect. That settles a lot of things about God in the Bible. That means his love is perfect, his grace is perfect. His mercy is perfect. His justice is perfect as well. So if a crime is committed, the penalty has to be paid. And the only way he could get you into heaven was to have somebody come and pay your penalty for you so you don't have to pay it. That's what we sung about. Jesus came because God so loved the woman he gave him that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's simple. The gospel is a simple thing. He came and took your hit. He took the bullet for you, took the noose, took the firing squad. He paid the price for your sin and my sin, so we don't have to pay it. This isn't too good to be true. It's too good to pass up. Amen. The eternal life is free. You know, I thought of this image. Let's pretend you're you're out in the Gulf of Mexico in a 21-foot open cockpit boat to fishing. It's got a Volkswagen Penta inboard engine. And you're having a grand time. The water is beautiful and you're fishing out there. And uh, all of a sudden you see this burst of water come up to the bottom of the boat and something is spawning and you're leaking. That's when you remember you forgot to bring your life in. And also you remember that because that engine is bolted to the boat, that that boat is going to go down and it fills up with water. It's not going to float and you're not going to be able to hang on to it. About that time is also when you look up and you see a shark fin circling around you. Fortunately, you get on your phone, you call 911, and they call the Coast Guard, and they tell you, we'll send a cutter out there, but it'll be as quick as we can. And you're in that boat, the sharks are surfing you, and the water's coming up to your shoulders and up to your neck, and all of a sudden you see that cutter come. 
A beautiful bow wing, a beautiful slick white boat coming at you. And they come alongside and say, we'll throw you a line. Here's a lifer. Put the lifers in front. We'll get you aboard. And you're so glad to see them. Then you say to the Coast Guardsman, that's the newest version of the car. He says, yeah, yeah. He says, you've got the turbo diesel engines in there, the electronic. He says, yeah, yeah. I've heard that they're not exactly reliable. So when they find it, we're great. Come aboard, we'll show them to you. So also, you have a very finicky navigation system on that boat. <laughs> well, come on aboard, get aboard, we'll show it to you. It works great. God is here to find you. There's people like that. They want to have all their questions answered before they get in the boat. Get in the boat first, then they'll answer your questions. You're going to have questions about God you're not going to have the answers for. The Bible says that the spiritual man can understand the things of God. The natural man cannot because they're foolishness unto him. Amen. The Chinese say it. If you want to have all the facts in line before you begin a journey, you're going to spend your whole life standing on one foot. Yeah. There's certain questions, solid objections that people have against Christianity. There's answers for them. Every one of them. But you still come to that point where you've got to believe that God is God and His Son died for you. And you get in the boat before the sharks catch you. So this is eternal life. This is what He came for. And it's what He offers you. That you may not have life that's eternal life and life more abundantly. He says, I would that you would be with me where I am. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. But if I come and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And there's no chapter quite like the third chapter of John. He says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but the world for him might be saved. God's for you. That's why he sent his Son. He that believeth not on him, he that believeth on him is not condemned, because he is believed in the Son, but he that believeth not is condemned already. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. The moment you're saved, the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. You've got it then. It doesn't say you're going to get it. You've got it. It's yours. And you can't lose it. you got your ticket to heaven in your hand and nobody can steal it from you. That settles the question, is there life after death? That question has haunted humanity since man's been around. What happens after I die? Job asked the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the tombs of Egypt, all the graveyards, man has asked that question. Does our life have any meaning? Shakespeare, in one of his plays, he says, life is but a walking shadow, a poor actor that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and he is heard of no more. Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Is that life for you? It isn't for me. Are you just a lucky bunch of atoms? A fortuitous concourse of protoplasm? Enchanted dust and enemy clod? Are you the, the plaything of an inscrutable fate? Or are you made in the image of God? A God who loves you and has a blueprint for your life that you can't improve on. God is for you. He's for you to come to Him. Don't worry about your objections. Get in the boat. You can get the answers when you're in the boat. <laughs> you know, but you're already in there. So God is for you, first of all, for eternal life. Then the second thing is for abundant life on earth. He wants your, the quality of your life here to be rich. I don't know how other people are, but my life has purpose in it. It has peace in it. It has promise in it. I know what I'm here for when I get up in the morning. I have faith in him. His relationship with me becomes more real as the years go by. I wasn't saved. I didn't accept Christ as my Savior until I was 32. And I was an independent, rugged little cuss. My favorite, my favorite philosophy, and I love to quote to anybody who would listen, that the best place for a man to find a helping hand is at the end of his own wrist. That's what I believe. That's how I live. And I discovered after I became a Christian that anything I can do, he can do better. <laughs> I discovered that I always like hiking, sailing in sailboats, and being out in the kayak in the ocean, and camping and being in the wilderness, and going off trail and hiking. I've always loved being in the woods. And I found that after I had crisis, my savior, <laughs> relationship with God, everything magnified. Everything was filled with more wonder. The sea was a special place for me. I also launched my boat knowing that the God that made the heavens has got his hand on my little kayak when I can see nothing around me but sky. It's a wonderful feeling walking with him. <clears throat> so he comes to give you abundant life on earth. Well, let's see what that looks like. And I won't be too long on this, but Peter, in his swan song, his second epistle, He's uh, 
It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He described himself as a servant. Peter was the prima donna of the church along with Paul. He was the greatest man in the church at that time. He didn't describe himself as, I, Peter, one of the heads of the church. He says, I am Peter, a servant. The Greek word there is doulos. It means a bond slave, a slave. The empty boats float high. <laughs> Full boats float low. The branches that bear the most fruit bend lowest to the ground. The greatest men of God who ever lived were humble. They knew it was God's greatness and not their own. Peter says, I'm a servant of Christ. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to say. I am your servant here in this church. I too am a servant of Christ. I'm Peter's helper. <laughs> I know. But I'm a servant of Christ. And I have the privilege of serving him. It is the great joy of my life. Mm. Servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have attained great <coughs> precious faith. He uses the word precious seven times more than any other writer of the Bible. <coughs> He's about to die. He's about to be crucified himself. He likes this. So he's writing to encourage in the second epistle to encourage people how to live as Christians. One of the things that kept me away from Christ, kept me away from, from Christianity when I was growing up, was hypocrites. People would go to church and they'd gossip about somebody. Or I, I'd really see them at home and they weren't the same. They weren't holier than now. When they were at home, they were different people. That's not how it ought to be. That's not what, we're, what he's teaching here. But it kept me away from Christ. Until I finally got to the point where I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. There is a God. If he's offered me life and peace and eternal life through Christ, why should I let the hypocrites keep me from what God has for me? Because God's for me. That's their problem. Let the hypocrites answer to God for themselves. By the way, let's define what a hypocrite is. The word hypocrite from the Greek word hypocrites means an actor. In the early days of the Greek stage, actors would hold up masks. You've seen the comedy and tragedy, a smile and a frown. That's a symbol of drama. They would hold a mask to pretend to be who they were acting out. They knew they weren't that person. They knew that they were behind the mask. A hypocrites. Somebody who pretends to be somebody he's not. That's a hypocrite. A hypocrite is not a weak, struggling Christian who just came to Christ, still got a truckload of the bad habits, and he's trying to shake them off. She's trying to get better. She's going for it. She's getting better as he goes along. He's getting better. He's growing stronger. He's getting holier. That's not a hypocrite. That's just a Christian who's struggling. So what what is a hypocrite, you know? And they're out there. They're out there, but but then so are the real saints of God, so are the real people. I was reading this week about George Mueller. He was a great man of faith. Amen. Great man of God. And he was on a, a, a boat to Quebec one time for a meeting. And the boat was enshrouded in fog. And there was no wind, it was just standing still. And George Mueller goes to the captain and says, I have a meeting. I have to be at Quebec. And the captain said, Well, you're not going to make the meeting because we can't travel in this fog. There's no wind. And he, he, he said to the captain, you, you come with me and we're going to go and we're going to pray. And as they're going down in the room and they're getting on their knees, the captain writes in his journal, I don't know what kind of a lunatic I saw this guy came out of. <laughs> you know, praying. But, but he prayed a simple prayer. And he's like, stop praying now. He said, what do you mean stop praying now? Go upstairs and check. See if the fog is gone and the wind's come up. The captain says he went upstairs and the fog was gone and the wind was blowing. That's the kind of faith you have. That's the kind of faith every one of you here can have. Because George Mueller's trust in what God said in this book was unshakable. Faith is standing upon what God said, believing that he cannot break a promise to you. There are 7,000 promises in this Bible from a holy, loving God to you, and he cannot break any one of them. It says that, by the way, as part of the magnificent chapter in Ephesians. And I'll be closing with course of scripture in Ephesians, but he, Paul asks you to remember, he says, remember therefore when you were unsaved, that at that time you were without Christ, being an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's where I was one second before I was saved. And the second I accepted Christ as my Savior, I went from a hopeless end to endless hope. Everything changed. I went from being on my way to hell to on my way to heaven. I went from having no promises from God to have them all mine. The change is amazing. It takes a whole lifetime. Salvation is a gift that's given to you in a moment. You'll spend the rest of your life unwrapping it. I'm 80 years old. I'm still finding out there's more in the present than I ever thought there was. It gets better as I go along. I feel more joy, more power, more energy, more brightness than I ever have in my life. 
I wouldn't trade places with any man on this earth. There's nobody I envy. God has been so good to me in all the things that count. There's love in my life and peace and faith and joy and purpose. I can't believe how good God has been to me. And he wants to be that way to everybody if you let him. You know, it's a... Uh, let me just share some names with you. Just name drop. Okay, uh, George Washington, John Quincy Adams, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Sir Isaac Newton, Michelangelo, and Shakespeare. Shakespeare was the greatest literary genius of all time. Question about it. Using a pro quo pen and a candle, he wrote lines that would be quoted forever. Michelangelo was the greatest artist that ever lived. He was a painter, a sculptor, and one of the world's greatest architects. His buildings are works of art. So Isaac Newton, um, Albert Einstein says that he was the greatest scientist that ever lived. Albert Einstein's second law of thermodynamics was based, uh, I'm sorry, Albert Einstein's law of relativity was based upon Isaac Newton's second law of thermodynamics. So Isaac Newton formed uh, the first, second, and third law of thermodynamics. He formed the gravity and many other things. He was one of the great minds of all time. Dwight David Eisenhower conducted the largest and most victorious and complicated military operation in the history of the world in the Norman invasion. It was a brilliant piece of military. He also was a two-term president that skillfully guided this country in a very difficult time. So he was a good man. John Quincy Adams was a congressman, member of the uh, cabinet, Secretary, Foreign Secretary, he was President of the United States. When he resigned his term for President, he served as a congressman in his local district of Massachusetts for the rest of his life. He was a true statesman. He also had an, an IQ of 164, which makes him the brightest president in American history. George Washington was the most remarkable man that ever lived. His character, his virtue, his honor, his courage kept that army together. And his leadership helped kept this nation together in those first eight years when it was close to falling apart, but for his inspired leadership. Now these men that I've mentioned to you, they all have something in common. They're all born again Christians. Amen. They're all believers in this God. John Quincy Adams got up every morning of his life at four o'clock in the morning to spend two hours reading the word. George Washington prayed on his knees every time he opened Congress. Even Lincoln did the same thing. Shakespeare, if you read his works, they're full of quotes from the book of Job. White men who love God and stop to glorify Him. So these were great minds, great intellects, great men. So I submit something to you here. If you don't believe in God, either they're wrong and you're right, or they know something you don't know, and you better really think about it. You better get out of the boat before the sharks catch you. They did. These were smart people. If you hit us all, Christy, you have to check your brains at the door. Tell that to Isaac. He didn't check his brains at the door. I could list you a lot of other names. They're out there. They're out there. And these people were real. Look what uh, Peter says here. Let me just finish. How am I doing? That's a That's a Better than I usually do. And Peter's pistol, remember, he's, he's speaking to the church and he wants to tell them his most important message before he's crucified. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This word knowledge is a specific Greek word, epigenosis. Epigenosis means correct and precise knowledge. People don't do well with God because they don't know who he is. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were the religious elite. They were all doctors of the law, brilliant intellectual men, leaders of Israel. And twice Jesus told them, you do greatly err. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. They didn't know what God really, who he was. And they never experienced him. Experienced his power. If I can get people to taste that, you'd be hungry for more of God. You could taste his reality. If you could see that he's involved, he's involved in my life. I can't believe I just heard myself say that. He's the creator of the universe. He is the great God Almighty, radiant in glory and honor and majesty and truth and beauty and justice and righteousness and purity and holiness. He is abundant in love and grace and mercy, omnipotent in wisdom and knowledge and power and the king of the universe, and he's involved with me. I'm a word when he's involved with me, no you better. I felt his presence today, I felt it yesterday, and I'll build it again tomorrow. And I'm hungry for you to know who I am. I'm hungry for all people who go to church that don't just sit there and go home the same as when they came. 
but they go deeper in Christ and higher in Christ, that's where this epistle goes. He says this. Grace be multiplied in you, and the knowledge of God and of Jesus, according as it is divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain to godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. <clears throat> virtue means excellence. <clears throat> the man of God, the woman of God, can be different from the people in the world, and that you have honor, you have virtue. That's what the world needs today. Honor people who tell the truth. You know, I, I told my kids when they have a job, you know, be there on time. Do what you're supposed to do the way you're supposed to do it. And if you're done doing your job and you have uh, idle time, go find the boss and ask for something else to do. You're getting paid. You know, do it all things as under the Lord with excellence. And when you do that, you feel good about yourself. You're not the regular people in the world who give as little as they can to get as much as they can. So there's a virtue in that. Whereby are giving unto us, listen to this, exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Christ didn't come to put a band-aid on a sagging man. He came to make a new man. Behold, all things are new. He must make a new creature out of you. Behold, all things. There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You're a new person. Not only are all your sins forgiven and forgotten, but you have the power to live a holy life. Amen. How to have a level of joy that the world doesn't know. You know, there's an awful lot of unhappy people out there. And sometimes you go to places, you, 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 I had a waitress the other day, and tell she was not very happy. And she sunk her fangs into me a couple times, and I just prayed for her. <laughs> and when I was all over, I said, that, that was great service you gave me, man. Thank you. And I, I, I saw that she was good at her job. I said, you're really, you're really good at your job. And she smiled. And said, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. She's not happy. I wonder why. Has she got no marriage or bad marriage? What's her situation at home? There's plenty of people out there who are suffering things. They don't have to suffer. That's another thing. That's another thing that popped in my mind. People, one of the old arguments is, well, how can God be loving? There's all this misery in the world. Babies are dying, and people are starving to death, and all the riots and crime all over the world. He gave us a book called the Bible. This book is the instruction manual for the human race. Mm -hmm. You know, the first verse in Psalm 19 says, these are the ways of God that will bless those who will walk in them. He's given an instruction manual. When people follow the instructions, they're not going to have the problems other people have. Two stories. One is about um, a Marine lieutenant, Harvard graduate in World War II. He was sent on a, a recon mission to one of the remote islands of the Philippines. <clears throat> he was told ahead of time there's cannibals there, and had others. It's a pretty nasty place. And he had some troubles as he went through the island with some of these tribes. He find, and, the, and the place was a squalor, it was filthy and dirty, and it was a, a nasty, ugly, awful place. He comes to this one village, and it's clean and neat, beautiful, beautiful houses, flowers all around, and gardens. Children happy and keep clothed and joy. And they say, what is going on here? And the, the chief of the village comes out and introduces himself and invites him and his men to have lunch with them. And the lieutenant and his men are eating lunch with this chief. And, and the lieutenant says, you know, and he says, how come your mission, your village is so different from all the other villages around here? He says, oh, many years ago a missionary came from here. And he told us about Jesus Christ and the ways of God. And he told us about the Holy Scriptures. And we've simply tried to live them as we have had. And God has blessed us. And the, and the uh, lieutenant says, well, I don't believe in all that stuff about God. And the chief said, well, it's a good thing for you that we do or you would have been lunch already. <laughs> <laughs> Another story of a minister who was talking with a man who was an atheist, <clears throat> a farmer, and the town he had his objections about why people suffer. And they're walking through the slums, and the, and the barber, the atheist, says, see, look at all this soil, look at all this mess here. If God has got ways, he'd do something about it. Just about that time, this young man walked by and his hair was matted and filthy and his beard was all scraggly and unkept. And the minister looks at him and says, it's a shame for a man to look like that in a town that's got a barber. And the person says, wait, wait a minute now. If he had come to me, I could have cleaned him up. The minister said, I rest my case. <laughs> you come to God, he'll clean you up. Amen. I spent a lot of time in Africa. And I went to the villages with the poverty would break your heart. Then they went to a little village of Bones that had a mud sticks in the middle of the Serengeti where people were praising him. I heard the best thing I've ever heard in my life from those four Maasai women as the sun was going down. Kilimanjaro and Bakker, they were singing the song in the Ahem. Those people were clean, they were happy, they were healthy. They had found Christ. God had blessed them because he followed them. You know, people get into trouble because they don't follow the instruction man. He says, give, give yourself this divine nature. 
Besides all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. That's what he wants for the church. In 2 Peter 3.18, the very end of this thing, Peter's last words to the church before he is crucified. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants for, for Christians. So God is for you to be saved and be a Christian, but then he's for you to grow. As you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, grow in him. When you do that, when you study the word, and when you pray. Those two things are indispensable. The scripture says, if you do these things, if you do these things, Peter, going back to Peter again, this, this is what he says here. He says, Wherefore, give diligence to make your calling election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. Now, if you go down to Barnes and Nobles or a big book company, go into the self help section, they've got everything from aroma, you know, advanced yoga to aromatherapy to every kind of Eastern religion <coughs> and self help classes. But every one of those books will have a caveat emptor. Every one of those books will have a license. We do not guarantee results. Results not guarantee. Things may vary. God says, I guarantee it. Amen. He says, I guarantee it. He puts it in writing. And if you do these things, your life is going to be enriched. You're going to see miracles that you never saw before. Mm. Now, I know I, I may be broken. I'm making some of you uneasy. That's good. You know what? That's good. Because there was times that I sat on a pew with a new Christian and the minister was making me uneasy and I didn't like it at first, but then I thought, well, you know, he's right. And I began doing something about it and things changed. Well, God, and whatever he was thinking when he did this, he brought me to this church. I have no question about it. I was in a whole new pattern for four years. I knew that God had something for me somewhere. And I knew he was going to open the door when his time was. I knew it. I told everybody, I'm waiting. He'll lead me there. And he led me here and he gave me the sign. He confirmed that this was the church. You know, Eric knows all about it. Some of us do too. The vote had to be unanimous here. If you vote me as a pastor, if it's 99 out of 100, I'm not your pastor. It has to be unanimous, and it was. And, it was, and that, was, that was God saying, okay. But what do I want from you? The things I'm telling you right now. I want you and all of your loved ones to know Christ, to have eternal life, but I want you to be strong. In the Lord, I want you to be full of faith and joy. Live holy lives that are full of radiance, that have meaning and joy to them. That's what I have, and I feel guilty sometimes. When I pass these unsaved people who are trudging through the gutters of their own broken dreams, suffering problems that God doesn't want them to suffer, dealing with difficulties He never intended them to have. It doesn't have to be that way. There's a way, a highway of holiness in them. A man don't be a wayfaring man, the scripture says, he will not err therein. God has a way for you to live. And there's no other way. Why would somebody be interested in that? What is it about this and it's free that somebody wouldn't want? <laughs> you know, I, I was amazed when they started Black Friday. I remember seeing on the news, people camping out in a Walmart camping lot the night before. Some zero jump for sleeping in sleeping bags to get there when they opened the doors for Black Friday. <laughs> to spend money they worked hard for to buy something that was eventually going to be outmoded, broken, or didn't fit anymore. And you can't give them eternal life. <laughs> it's free. All you have to do is say yes, Lord, and it's all yours. It's an amazing thing. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Let me just go to the end. We know that Paul was an apostle. And he was the world's great evangelist. But did you know that he was also a pastor? His letter to the Ephesians is considered to be the outs of the New Testament. It contains some of the highest and loveliest and loftiest thoughts, thoughts found anywhere in the Bible. But it was his church. And he, he loved those people. And he yearned for them to have these things. And in Jeremiah, God says, I will give you pastors after my own heart that shall teach you and feed you with knowledge and understanding. A pastor after God's own heart will feel the way Paul did about the church, the way I do about your heart. I'm, a, I'm an imperfect man. I know that. I have my flaws and my quirks. I know that. But I know I'm called of God. I know I'm called of God to pastor. I know I'm called of God to mission. I have no doubts about that at all. With all my weaknesses and my flaws, I still know who I am and what I'm supposed to do. And I know how I feel about all of you. And when I pray for you in the course of the week, I pray with joy. And I pray this prayer. This is the prayer that Paul prayed. And it's the prayer that I pray for you. He wanted this for his church. I want this for my church. And every pastor who pastors should want this for his people. Listen to what he says here. 
And notice that these are all things that are inside. It's not talking about houses and cars and what you look like or what kind of clothes. It's all things that are inside. Paul says, for this cause, meaning the cause of my life for you, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That bowing my knees means it's in a continuous prayer. He's always praying this for his people. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his book, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Mm -hmm. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 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 To be filled with all the fullness of God. I should do a second sermon on just what that means. What does that mean? I won't do it right now. Because <laughs> God is worse than I'm trying to be. <laughs> <clears throat> what does it look like to be filled with the fullness of God? All I can tell you is this is what I want for you. <clears throat> what I want for my children and my grandchildren, for my family, for everybody on that compound, for everybody in this church. With all my heart, I desire that you have this. Because God wants you to have it. Because he loves you. God is for you. I started with those words, I'll end with them. God is for you. But as I close this message, let me add a little question to that. God is for you. Are you from God? Before we end the service, if you're here today, and you're still in that boat, and your boat's leaking, and the death rate's 100%, everybody's boat's leaking, everybody's boat's going down sooner or later, you're in that boat, the sharks are swimming around you. I urge you right now to get out of that boat. Because right now God is offering you his love, his guidance, the fullness of a relationship with him. If you're here right now and you've never accepted this Christ as your Savior, stand up right where you are when we pray for you. Don't leave here without him. You can leave here today beginning an entirely new life that's more wonderful than you can ever imagine. If you don't know Christ, you're in a dangerous spot. You can know him in the fullness of his love and his companionship and all the blessings he's got to give to you. Is there anyone here? Don't, don't let pride keep you in your seat. If you've got questions, let him answer them for you. But don't miss the boat. That cutter's coming alongside here today and the crew members say, come on, get on board here before your boat sinks. If you're here today, stand and receive Christ in prayer. It doesn't take but a second. You can settle this forever. Asked you to make a decision. You will make a decision. You'll make a decision to say yes to Jesus, or you'll make a decision to say no to Jesus. But you will make a decision before you leave him. You'll either be to accept his love and his forgiveness, his life, or to reject it to say no. What is your decision? Father, I stand upon your promise that says your word shall not return to you empty. I know I have preached the truth here today. I know I have preached your word today. You said it will not return to you empty. I'm standing upon that promise. But whether it's now or some other time, the words I have preached will be as seeds that take root downward and bear fruit upward to eternal life for all who are present here. Bless us now. This message may find its fruit in us. May it remain in us. Help us. We know you're for us. Help us all to be free. In Jesus' name.